Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's weekly market check-in with myself, Greta Wall, and the leader of T3 Live's Inner Circle Virtual Trading Floor, David Prince. As always, David, thanks for doing this uh, with me today. How's it going? Good. Today is uh, a little different than what we've become accustomed to, but uh, <laughs> considering, not, not so bad. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Let's get right into uh, the topic for today's session, and that is Micron technology. This is a stock that you and I talked about uh, last week, and we discussed how uh, it was being re-rated by the market, and you compared it to uh, Apple back in, you know, when their business was kind of changing from more hardware sales to a software company. So, uh, Micron, you sent out this tweet, again, just a reminder, originally saying Micron is getting what we call re-rated as a growth stock. That means good earnings equal higher stock price and multiple. It's powerful stuff. And again, comparing it to Apple, and that's uh, what we discussed last week. Stock is down today, but was on quite the run since our discussion last week, last Tuesday. Let's look at the chart as of the close. You can see well above the 21-day and the 50-day moving average uh, year to date so far. So uh, talk about how you managed Micron since we last discussed it, uh, what you were doing with the stock and how you plan to manage and approach this stock moving forward. Sure. So uh, going back to last week, we saw 122s. And I said, you know what? We, we had been playing calls, uh, 110s, 120s, 125s. I got flat those calls. And on a pullback to 117, 118s, we bought the 125 monthly calls. And I bought stock uh, in the 117s a few times last week. On Friday, we had a little run towards the close, but I had a decent sized position. So I trimmed a bit. And then Monday, we saw a big call out of, uh, might have been Bank of America, but frankly, I can't remember who it was, basically talking about a lot of what we've talked about, which is that they are, uh, part of the gravy train, the gravy train being NVIDIA, and that as well as NVIDIA does, you can expect Micron to do for the time being that they are a big part of Blackwell and the rollout and uh, raise their price target to the 140s. Micron had a previous high a week before of 122s. We took out the 122s in a short order. We were 127s. Um, I sold all of my 125 calls that went up, you know, huge. I sold them too soon. I always make that dumb mistake, but I think I made 50, 70 percent, sold those and then trim most of my stock once we got over 125. I now remain with the trailer. And uh, frankly, I'm not that bullish the markets and haven't been for about two weeks. So I'm not rushing to buy it back, but I will be soon. And uh, that's how we play it. So mm -hmm. I, I continue to think it'll be a buy on dips. It'll be one of the few stocks, in my opinion, that's viable because I think the market's changing. I don't think I know we can see it. Um, and uh, I, I do think it'll be a buy. I just think you have to be price sensitive. I think the whole buy higher, sell higher, that little game is over for a bit. Mm -hmm. When stocks have big moves like this, uh, you are very good at recognizing, you know, I think we're hitting kind of, you, you, you don't necessarily uh, call the top, uh, but you are good at noticing that there's really just not that much more room here Stocks obviously uh, correct via time and price. So a lot of times it's just time kind of hanging out in a certain range. When a stock goes from major growth to more trading in like a range in a range, mm -hmm. uh, how do you change your strategy on that specific name? Sometimes I do less options because when we become more choppy and range bound, we simply go back and forth, which means options just tend to erode. So I tend to be more stock enthusiastic versus the options. That's the one main thing I do, and I use levels. So for instance, yesterday on the pullback, I said, hey, 127, the pullback to 122s is probably viable because that's the previous highs. But then you get underneath and the markets change, you go back to levels. So frankly, without I'm not looking at the chart right now, but I remember now it's going to be 117s. We get closer to 117s, it's very viable. We get beneath there, 113s. That's that previous high, the earnings breakout. We get beneath there. By the way, this is cool because I literally am not looking at the chart. And I remember this. <laughs> um, and we get, but I don't know the exact dot, dot, dot. But we get beneath there. Then two Fridays ago, we bottomed at about 107s because we got lucky and started our position there. So then you become a little bit more reliant upon the chart. In other words, 
I always like to tell people in these great bull markets, if everyone's looking at the same level on the chart, you have to do what I call cheat, meaning you see the 50 day, you see the 21 day, you see the eight day, you gotta buy it in front because everyone and their mother is trying to buy it at that exact spot. So um, we are no longer in this perfect bull market. We are you know, bending a bit. So I'll do a little bit less. I will wait for my spots. And then when I do, I will also not look for new highs the way I just did over the past couple of weeks. So mm -hmm. in short order, we started at 107s. It hit 127 yesterday. That's 20 points. That's almost 20% on Micron in two weeks. That's not normal for Micron. I think it might take a little break, same way NVIDIA is taking a break. So what I will do is I will trade around a core and let the market breathe and perhaps um, just be cognizant that a new high is not coming for a few weeks or a couple of months till the market maybe absorbs these insane gains we've had last year and this first quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul in the comments was asking at what price you liked Micron and I do think you just answered that. Uh, for everyone who's with us, uh, live, do submit your questions for David Prince, you know, specific stocks, specific strategies, whatever you want him to answer, and we'll get to them. Paul, I see your other question. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But yes, David, you do have an impeccable uh, memory for stock charts and hey, one, one last Very thing. Impressive. Besides, thank you, I appreciate it. Besides those little kind of pivot areas I gave you, you can always mm -hmm. go back to the 8 and 10 day. The 8 day, funny enough, is right at that special spot, 117. By the way, the 8 day is a pretty bullish area, so my point is that it realistically, if we're going to have a pullback on the Qs and NASDAQ, then there's no reason this can't go all the way to the 8 day, which is 117 is a level I already gave you. So okay. seems yeah. that would be a really special area that we'd probably bounce off of if we got that low. All right, great. All right, so you mentioned NVIDIA taking a breather, and it, it definitely is. Um, you sent out this tweet over the weekend saying the NVIDIA, this chart that you were um, grabbing was about a day or so old, but it did the trick. Uh, the name is name has only been below the 21 day one time this year and for a brief moment it's going to be a key spot to hold for technicians in the 889 to 890 area a look at the chart as of yesterday's close and you can see we closed just above that 21 day moving average that purple line is the 21 day uh give me your thoughts on nvidia where we're at uh and what this means for the stock moving forward so it's a fluid market and charts are fluid. So that line actually moved up to about 898 if you're using using SMA. So technically, yeah. basically, part of the reason we flushed today is we finally traded beneath the 21 day for the first time in a while. And once we did, that's why we flushed all the way below 880. Um, my thought is this. When the wheels fall off and everyone decides the game is over, I'll be a buyer because I don't think – the game is over and I don't think Nvidia is about to slow down, but I do think that stocks need to breathe. And this stock, a lot of people forget at the, at the close yesterday was still up 87%, I think for the year that, I mean, I, I had to check the, like, that's crazy, right? This isn't a small cap stock and forget about where it's come from. So um, yeah, it, it can breathe and maybe, uh, maybe even revisit that 850 area where I bought uh, during AI, the AI event. We bought them literally 851, 850. So I will be like today, one of the first things I did, NVIDIA opened down 20 and change, it bounced to 889. I was like, yeah, I like it there. I shorted some, it went down six, seven dollars. I covered most of it and took a cute trade. Um, but ideally, I want to be an investor again in NVIDIA at the right price. And it's probably going to go a bit lower before I can be an investor again and feel like this is a level I don't have to trade it for a couple of dollars. Uh, so if we don't recapture that 21 day, which again is close to 900, I think we have room all the way down to 850. Some people will even be looking at the 50 day, which frankly, I think is below 800. Let's take below a look. Below 800, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's 781, but it's rising. So it'll get somewhere in the 800s. Um, let's, I'd ideally love to be an investor again in NVIDIA somewhere between 850 and uh, 800. When it comes to- uh, I may change my mind though, it might force me to, but that that's my ideal. What I want, what the market does, two different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it comes to uh, the market environment that we're currently in, uh, do you do a lot more of what you like to call those, those cute trades versus uh, you know your longer term swings? Absolutely. So um, 
we had this crazy growth so much where we had this waiting list and the new people I kept saying, listen, it's been a wild year. It's mm -hmm. not just about like this year. I mean, a wild 12 months, right? Including like stuff like Immunome and how bullish we were Amazon down at 140. I am doing less right now. There is just less to chew on. There is less risk reward. I literally yesterday before this pullback today, I said to Rick and Kira who helped with inner circle with me, I said, do you have one stock long you really like at this price? I, I said, I can't find one. I am super excited about risk reward because that's for me, it's, I give it really simple. Is there one where I think the reward is like three or four times the risk? And I'm like, I can't find anything like that. So I sat there and I kept asking and uh, I've had puts on cues for about a week now. Yesterday I had two sets. I had the uh, 442s and 445s. And what I basically told Inner Circle to answer your question directly is, I don't see a lot to invest in. I'm a trader and we have Q puts, we had uh, Abercrombie puts. I'll probably have as many shorts as longs uh, over the near term. So there's gonna be a lot more uh, Q trading or simply trader mentality right now versus I'm buying this and I'm buying more when it gets weaker. We've barely corrected. So I'd like to see more of a correction and I'll be doing a lot of those cute trades right now. Mm -hmm. uh, some important news for the market this morning was Tesla's Q1 deliveries and production. Well under expectations on both deliveries and production. Uh, num uh, well, actually, yeah, well under expectations. It's just a mess. Expected production, but it was a, quite a mess. And uh, the stock responding in kind uh, to that. Uh, look at the Tesla chart as of the year to date chart as of the close yesterday. I mean, this stock, as we all know, has been totally beaten up so far in 2020. Worse than the S&P for the quarter. Yeah, you uh, had tweeted oh, and talked about yeah. some on Twitter that we could possibly This is a perfect, perfect conversation that. for what you said about Q. Sorry, go mm -hmm. on. So we could possibly maybe see a rally on bad numbers. We're obviously uh, not getting that. So the market was more disappointed uh, than even expected. Uh, give me a reaction to Tesla's numbers this morning and uh, if you did anything with the stock this sure. morning after. First, here's my reaction. <gasps> um, <laughs> so they they were like awful, right? Um, under yeah. 400 getting to 387, that 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 was just it's bad. There's no, there's no sugar coating and he could say it's not demand and it's factory closing down and so on, but it, it's just an awful number. Um, I want to answer two parts. First, this is great, right? By the way, I lost money on Tesla calls today, people, um, like 85%. Um, but here's a great example of how I look at the market right now. So I said yesterday, I said, you know, I have a gut feeling, but I have no empirical evidence to suggest I'm right. But I have a gut feeling that if Tesla isn't horrific, there is no one who hasn't lowered their production numbers and it, it delivers and it, it, it's just across the street and downgrades and price target moves down this is really set up to maybe go higher if they're not horrific but i said under 410 it could be bad i didn't even think under 390. so uh we bought calls not stock and we bought short-term calls in other words really a binary bet on this outcome so i am not comfortable investing in a stock like Tesla where the fundamentals are breaking down here. But I will do what you asked about a cute trade. And here's how cute it is. And when I buy some, because I was buying the uh, uh, 180s, right? 180 calls for this week. And we bought some just to walk you through. Bought some at three, they go to 360, I sold some. Then they tanked with the stock yesterday. We bought some as low as, I think they traded $1.80. I bought some as low as two. At the end of the day, when they traded three, I couldn't stop selling them. In fact, for my newsletter, I just said, take 90, 100% of it because you're up like 40% in quick order. So here's my point. Today could have turned out to be 420, 430, and the stock probably would have been up seven. But in this market, take your Q trades, you're up a little bit of money, lock in your gains, and wait for a better spot because I don't think it's a great place to invest. So even by doing that yesterday, I made it so today I gave back any gain I had yesterday, but it's not painful for me. I have a bunch of calls I bought at two, I sold at three, and I have a bunch of calls I bought at three that are not zero. It's like it's not it's not a a pain trade for me. So it's a cute trade, and I'm taking my profits quicker 
and I'm not buying thousands of shares of Tesla just guessing, well, the bottom's going to be on deliveries tomorrow without evidence and like seeing it down 10 and puking it. So yes, trading cute and Tesla is a great example of how to minimize your losses if you are you know, inclined to take along on something like that. Uh, it's also great because, you know, I've been sharing on Twitter more than I have in a couple of years. I, I always tell you, I hate the people that like tell everyone about this home run they had. Even people on my chat, when they do it, I always I want to instill a rule. Like if you say this, you get kicked off. I'm actually thinking about doing it, but I'm sure T3 will be pissed off. But I hate people to tell you about something like, you know, an hour later. And I've been sharing like all these wins from Immuno to Amazon. And I'm very clear. I don't kind of say something. I say exactly what I feel. I don't tell anyone to do anything. Well, I tell them what I'm doing. Anyway, my point in all this is now I feel like there's just not that much. But here's the interesting part. Now all the loud people come out, right? Like Tesla's broken and Tesla's this and Tesla's that. I think it's time to just take a deep breath, not too much, ignore all the, the craziness. There are going to be a lot of angry people out there. They missed the bull market. Now they want the bear market. I'm just stepping back, not doing too much, waiting for my spots. And my my like MO right now is hold on to these great gains for the last 16, 17 months. I think I got long-winded there, but you get the idea. Oh, that's great. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, I see all of your questions. We will get to them in just a bit. So hang tight with us here. All right, David, the labor market is in focus this week, which means uh, the Fed is also, of course, in focus this week. Anything to do with the labor market right now, is all about the Fed. We got the Jolts number this morning, 8.75 million job openings in March. It's basically in line with expectations. Maybe like uh, a mini bullish, but nothing, not, not enough to make a difference to the markets. Tomorrow morning, uh, we'll get that ADP private employment report. It's supposed to see an acceleration of private job growth, but it's like 158,000, not crazy. The official jobs report will be out on Friday. It's supposed to be a little bit of a slowdown, but a little bit lower of a unemployment rate under the expectations. Last time, the unemployment rate, I think, was the big... Uh, rally driver for the jobs number. You know, we have that huge headline number, but the unemployment rate jumping un unexpectedly to that 3.9%. I think really the focus is on wage growth. Uh, if we're looking for signs Thousand of slowing percent. inflation, the wage growth is the real driver here. How are you positioning yourself ahead of these numbers this week? Tomorrow's number, of course, not being as important as Friday's number. Uh, but what are you looking for in the market? I know it's all based on, you know, where are we pre the print on yeah, Thursday at the close, but <laughs> that's going to be a lot of it, right? So okay. if we do sell off enough and we're under some key uh, averages, like Q's broke the 21 day uh, for the first time in a while today and, and they're underneath and there's room to go down another three, four in the Q's. So, um, you know, spies fared a tad bit better recently, but overall, that's going to be about where we are. Um, I am now of the point that, so everyone for a while keeps saying, the Fed tells you, like he even told you last week after the PCE, hey, everything's fine. It's moving in the right direction. And we're going to, he didn't say it, but everyone's pretty comfortable that maybe we are going to get three cuts. And then there are a lot of people out there like, we're going to get cuts, but no way in hell there's three. But the market can keep looking past it. Here's the problem. It's actually the bond market. The bond market is telling us this week, there is no way in hell you guys are yeah. getting these three cuts. And I think that this NFP report becomes like omnipotent, like it is the end all because the bond market is screaming at us to stop being so bullish. And if it's hot, it, it could be rough. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to react a little bit more than normal, not get too cute in front of it unless we just have a massive sell off that kind of presents more of a long opportunity. and kind of kind of react. I also suggested to Inner Circle today, I said, I get it. Small caps haven't outperformed in God knows how long, but it's back to that same old playbook. There are going to be less stocks to choose from if rates remain, remain higher for long. And if we are not going to get as many cuts as hoped, and if inflation remains stubborn, they're only going to buy a few stocks like NVIDIA and Meta and Amazon that have earnings that aren't traded at the highest PEs, it's going to go back to a few special big cap leaders in Mag7, you know, minus the Apple and Teslas. But th that's going to be the playbook. And sure enough, we rallied off lows today as TLT caught a, caught a cute little bounce. And you might have noticed IWM went to lows of the day. Stocks like RH that I thought might have a shot 
tanked because they're so interest rate related, right? Housing's miserable today. Um, so that playbook is going to be what works for now till we get a soft report, not like jolts today. I mean, a soft report to say, oh my God, we really might definitively have two cuts. Maybe it's actually three cuts. We, we need, NFP will be a big deal. Mm-hmm. So I'm and not going to do a lot. I'm not going to take big bets ahead of it, frankly. Mm-hmm. Talk and about I'll, the, oh, sorry. No, keep going. <laughs> no, I was going to say, and I, I, what's like today saved me because, uh, you know, and I think it's important to say, I've had so many winners and you get these people who are like, you don't talk about your losers. I haven't had that many. Today, I sucked win in RH. I, I told Inner Circle, I said, you know, I, I really like this as a turnaround story. So I'm going to start buying some when it pulls back from that amazing earnings play we had. We had it for earnings and it was a huge win for us, for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I said it needs to come in 10 or 15. When it pulls back, I'll buy some. Today, people said, so you're going to buy more. It's now down into your buy spot, 330. I said, the whole game changed today. He said the bond market is saying don't touch anything that's interest rate related, related, specifically housing, specifically an RH type of stock. And I took a loss quicker than you can say fruitcake when it was like 317. Or where is it now? RH is, yeah, 317. Now it's 307. It was the best loss I ever took. This thing's getting crushed. So um, how did I get on RH? I'm just getting long. Uh- bond market and oh the bond market so the bond market is just saying hey you can only buy a few stocks like nvidia that can prosper in a high interest rate environment where we're not getting a bunch of rate cuts it's only going to be a few names all over again so you can put iwm and restoration hardware and a few all the all those auxiliary plays that a lot of people shopify all those you can put them in your back pocket so the macro changes a bit that's Mm -hmm. what i was (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and uh, talk about well, looking at the bond market, you know, screaming higher. Uh, a lot of it is to do with the strong manufacturing data that we got yesterday, that ISM manufacturing index r- rising to 50.3 from 47.8 in February. That 50 mark is really key because it's the first expansion of first the manufacturing expansion. sector uh, in 17 months. And uh, after that data was released, we did, we've seen CME Group's FedWatch tool dial back the expectations for June rate cut. We're still around 57%, uh, but you know we were over 70% on the June rate cut last week. Um, it goes back so, to yeah. that same thing. The market's comfortable with looking past everything, but at some point, all of this data we're getting, people are going to be like, mm-hmm. all right, I, I can't yeah. just, like, there's a fire in the house. I can't keep running into, there's a fire. I can't keep running into it and winning. At some point, that fire is going to burn me. That, that's where we are. Like, yeah. for some reason, there's a fire. We keep running. We jump over the fire. We have a party. <laughs> We're going to get burned <laughs> by running in the fire eventually. And that's what this data suggests. So that's why NFP could really be a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So this week's NFP, I definitely agree, is a, a bigger deal than the weeks we've had uh, or the months we've had leading up to this. Okay. Let's uh, get to some audience questions before we get into our, our closing segments here. But uh, Paul wants to know if you have a fixed selling strategy. Uh, say, for example, you set your stop losses at 25%. God, no. Paul, this is uh, a lot of people ask me that. And I'm like, I hate that, Paul. I, I, I don't understand why people don't know this. And I promise you, Paul, this will be some of the best information you'll ever get from me. Maybe there'll never be anything worth hearing from me again. But this one I I really believe is true. Every environment is different. So I always go back to COVID where everyone talks about it. There's like videos of me talking at like uh, events in Vegas about this. During COVID, my playbook was, well, if I die and there's not many people left in this world after this great pandemic, if I die with 5, 10 or 100 million, like, who cares like seriously who cares secondly are people really going to care that amazon's trading at mm, 20 or 30 times sales or 15 times sales or are they going to care that it's one of the few companies that can not only survive but actually prosper and get stronger during this environment and next is it well off 50 percent from its highs and present an opportunity that like is four times reward versus the risk wow, I'm willing to be down 10% to make 100%. And that's how I look at all events like this, Paul. 
So now let's go to today. Today, the market is not where we were during COVID. We're up so much, it's not even funny. If I was a macroeconomist, I would be homeless because I never dreamed in a million years that we could have the velocity and interest rates we've had and that the market go this hot. Thank God I don't fight trends for the hell of it, but I never could have imagined this. But I do know when I talk to people, I say, listen, the risk reward is not the same. So you better not be willing to risk as much. So now up here, I'm much tighter on my losses, i.e. restoration hardware. I was down about 5% this morning or whatever the percentage is, probably something like that. And I was like, I am so done. It's not even funny. But at different points in the market, I will easily be willing to risk 10 or 15. I've been willing to risk 15% on something for that type of upside, like a biotech that I think might be up four or 500%. I've done it with him, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the nature of biotech, but you have to understand what you're doing. So I can't tell you how many biotech stocks you have to be down 20% to make four or 500%. But when it comes to where we are in the markets today, I am much tighter. We're talking about 2% losses, 5% losses. I And when it comes to gains, it's still about what is the upside? So when MU at 107 with the earnings high 113, when I was buying at 107, 110, I always thought 130 is very realistic. Like I really think in the next four to six weeks, we can get to 130. But once we're at 127, I'm out of most. Next, I'm definitely not going to buy it up there. Because if I think the upside is 130, the risk reward starts to look really crappy. So how I sell is always a function of what stock I'm buying, what individual stock or index, and is the risk greater than the reward, the same, or is it like pale by comparison is the reward that big? That is how I sell stocks. I believe, I want to finish this. Paul, if you're running 50, 100 grand, throw out everything I said. Keep your losses small. Try and hold your winners a little longer. Make 500 here, 1,000 here, 2,000 there, and build your account to be able to do one day what I'm talking about. But for real money management, it doesn't mean that like you could be 20 years old starting out for all I know. But for real money management, that's how I believe you should trade. For someone who's trying to grow a small account into a much larger account, it's simple math. Have many more wins, have a ton of base hits and doubles, don't worry about home runs, and keep your losses small. And if you're right, only 50% of the time you'll kill. Mm -hmm. And that's how I take profits, whether I'm up or down. Great. Wolf wants to know how you determine your levels. Yeah, so like as basic as it gets, SMA, 8, 10, 21, and I use pivots, and I'm big on pivots because I see there's sometimes short term as important as a moving average. Okay, great. And Katrina wants your thoughts on IWN. Katrina, it's going to be tough unless we get a soft number, even though it's lagged the indices forever, and there hasn't been this sort of discount versus the Qs and SPY and small caps ever since that index existed. If we continue to see hot numbers, it's a block. It may not really have a ton of risk, right? The way we're used to with small caps because the underperformance is so severe, but I don't know about much, much upside. If we finally slow down and we see it through an economic number like the NFP and yields back off, then I see no reason why the breakout that it keeps trying to happen. Like we closed at highs on Friday. We were long. And it felt great for a second. I was long on Monday and I sold a bunch 211s. But here we are, right back under 205 to have a real concerted breakout that holds levels and continues higher and backs, you know, stair steps higher. We, we need a need a decent report. Otherwise, it's just going to be like a lot of like two steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back, two steps back, one step forward, and it's going to kill option buyers. So mm -hmm. Look for a look for some evidence to say the economy is slowing down. Mm -hmm. Daniel wants to know if you like GDX or GLD long for a cute trade here. I do not simply because I don't have an edge there, but mm -hmm. I understand why people are bullish gold and it's a, it's a, a big thing for people. But I've made a lot of money in Bitcoin, Bitcoin proxies, and it works for me. And I pretty much in my head decided Bitcoin replaced gold pretty much about three years ago. So that's where my focus is. But I get the whole goal trade and what's happening. I just would be steering you wrong to give you my thoughts when I really have no edge there. 
Yeah, totally. Uh, Jess Want wants to know your thoughts on the possibility of an NVIDIA stock split. I think SMCI is more likely to split before NVIDIA, mm -hmm. but we, you could expect one in, in NVIDIA eventually. But I think SMCI is the one that, like, I literally think in the next couple of weeks you'll see one. And uh, NVIDIA, I'd say, is 50 50. Okay. And then Paul, uh, he submitted this question when you were talking about uh, the market environment and the bonds and stuff. Way more um, so. Yeah, is this a scalper's market? So Paul, like literally one of the first things I did, Paul, this morning, right? So I was like, ah, NVIDIA. We, I, I, I was really suspect on NVIDIA yesterday. We played it from the short side um, and made a little bit of money. And then, you know, I had that bounce at the end of the day. But one of the first things I looked at today was, I was like, all right, NVIDIA bounces at all. Because I'm not big on shorting a stock like NVIDIA opening down over 20. Just rarely works out, right? It's the number one stock in the market. So I said, any bounce, I'm going to short it. And I shorted some, like I said, 888, 889, something like that. But guess what? I wasn't like, it's NVIDIA. So I, I was like, by 883, 882, I was out of most. And I don't think I covered any below 880 and it is an $800 stock. So it was a scalp and it took all of, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. Classic scalpers market when you get volatility increasing like this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is specific, but Jonathan wants, he says he's long Micron at 126, asking your opinion on if he should sell right. here. So like I'd literally be breaking every law in the book to give you advice yeah. on whether you should buy or sell. But here's the thing. Let's, let's pretend that I'm not old and respectful of the law. I still would never answer that. I'm going to tell you why. I do not know how much money you have. I always tell people, when they take mm -hmm. losses or buys, it's partially about, and not, not enough people talk about this. Is this the one stock you own? Do you have other capital if we pull back? Why did you buy it? What was your purpose? How much did you buy? Do you have firepower when you're lower? So the one thing I can tell you, I can guarantee you legally, this is the right thing to ask. You need to ask yourself all those questions before you make that decision. And anyone who says, oh yeah, you bought it wrong, just sell it, without that information, is a complete asinine idiot. Mm -hmm. So you need to know what was the reason you owned it? Do I have enough liquidity? Did I just use all my liquidity? Was my plan to hold it for two years? And without that information, you will have a tough time answering it. You need to know all that before you buy it. I'm not trying to be tough on you. I just think enough people, if people just did the important basics that seem like, I know it's annoying. Maybe it's a little old school. It works, right? Um, I can't give you advice and you almost can't do the right thing till you look at that scenario. If it's all your money and you have no firepower, if things get worse, if you pay your rent with this account, then of course you would sell. So that's the information I tell people one needs to make decisions like that. Mm -hmm. Sorry to be like, I don't mean to be dramatic about it, but I think it's okay. Yeah, totally. Uh, Benjamin uh, wants to know about the 9100 rule on XLE here. Not the guy to ask. Yeah, I was gonna say it doesn't right, seem like right. your <laughs> okay, I, I, like, I got so many you know oil experts and on my chat it's not even funny, but not my okay. story. All right, there you go. Um okay, and a follow-up on that question about Micron, uh, would you so Paul for Jonathan is asking, should he sell covered calls against the shares? Uh, is that a strategy you would use to protect any losses, basically? You know, it depends. I do it with long-term holdings where I think I am not going to get taken out. I just want to bring income. So I like that strategy. If you want to hold something for very, you know, for a long time, and mm -hmm. especially if premiums are higher, the thing is, it also prevents you from being able to trade around a position. So if I have enough stock where it's not going to interrupt my flow, meaning let's say I have 5,000 shares of XYZ and I sell 25 calls against half the position so even if it pops really big i'm not stuck not being able to sell it i don't mind that i typically don't do it if it locks me into something because i want to especially in something that's volatile because i want to be able to trade around a position i'm pretty good i think and i'm pretty good with volatility so i tend to buy stocks that move a lot so i don't do it regularly because it actually would hurt me right like Micron, had I done that, let's say I bought at 107 and I wanted to lock in my games and not take too much risk and sell the 120 calls against my position, I would have missed so much money. So I only like to do it when I think something is basing 
and needs to rest. And then every time it goes up, I'll short some or, or, or sell a call spread. Uh, not a call spread. I'll sell some calls, uh, covered calls. Otherwise, I don't like to do it. So it's really mm -hmm. dependent on the time. If you're something's breaking out, I want to enjoy the fruits of my labor and the position. I don't want to sell covered calls. So it's when I think something is plateauing. All right. Good. All right. So, David, I know that you're not totally excited about the market right now. And you sent out this tweet yesterday saying it's a less is more market. Usually, if you're patient, a solid idea comes along. But over the past two weeks, while doing a bit less, you have still found some beauties. Don't swing at every pitch. Most are eh, at best right now. Um, so just for everyone who's still with us live, we have a great number of people here. Just your thoughts on the overall market environment, how your personal trading is going. Uh, you know, every morning I know, or and after the close, you know, every day you're looking for ideas that you are excited about and there aren't, isn't very much of that happening right now. So how has your personal trading strategy maybe shifted during this less exciting time? Uh, literally, the first thing is, not in the slightest bit. I'm just happy that I'm not a complete schmuck and recognize the risk award maybe wasn't great for the past couple of weeks. And that's why I had puts. And my game plan is to make a little bit of money here and there and then work my butt off and not be overly defensive, like not trade scared because trading scared gets you no, nowhere. But what I'm working on and what I'm trying to help people I mentor on is one thing, not giving too much of it back because really like it's easy to like make money in a bull market but this is where like being a good trader being a good manager this is where you really find out so uh i used rh as an example today do you buy more and just hope it works no look at tlt and look at the way yields are popping and look at this strong economy we may not get enough cuts for anything that's so connected to interest rates to work so take your losses fast and don't give back the amazing 12 months from last year and three months from this year. So it's wait. And I, I gave examples, right? It was about seven days ago. I bought MSTR at 1,200 and like 30, 40, 50. And then two days, it bounced to 1,500. I sold it. And I sold it too soon. It went up to 1,800. And then we bought NVIDIA at 850. And then it bounced to 950. And then we bought Micron. And then it went up 20 points. And then I bought Q puts this week that doubled or Maybe some are up like a triple. So there's stuff to do. Just do less of it and wait for your spots. And I think you can still make money in this market. But the final thing I said, I said this on my AM call and I said it yesterday, less positions, size appropriately, meaning don't assume you're going to get the bottom. So leave some room. And that's how I think you can be green, even in a market that's correcting like this. Mm -hmm. uh, be willing to play the short side and don't carry 15, 20 positions, because you'll get nowhere. You'll have three wins, you'll have three losses, you'll be flat on the rest, you'll overdo it with getting hit on commission. So it's less positions, a little less size, so you don't trade with emotion. And uh, that, that's how I'm going to handle things. Okay. Last call for questions, everyone. We have a couple more, David, but I know I need to let you get back uh, to trading. So this is the last chance to submit any questions, everyone. Deepak wants to know your thoughts on SMCI buy area on this pullback. You know, I was looking today and I was thinking, God, I hope they don't announce a split before this before this happens. <laughs> that is literally <laughs> what happens today. So I looked this morning and I said, God, are we really going to get down there towards that 800? That's the last time I went long. It was low 800s. Um, if you look, the previous lows down at 855 and the 50 day are 850. So your special area, if it ever were to happen, is 850. That's like where, ooh, this could be a great buyer. I don't know if it happens. I will say that I'm not an expert chartist. I use them like I'm reading better than most, but my point is that like certain terminology and so on, I don't know. But I do know that 21 day is higher than the 8 and 10, and it's kind of messy. It's not the perfect chart. So the way I'm going to play SMCI is pretty basic. I'm going to hope to hell it corrects. And when it feels a little bit too painful for people, I'll be buying it. And hopefully that'll be somewhere between, at, I, I, I doubt I'd buy it above 900, somewhere between 900 and 850. And the reason I'm comfortable, like some people are like, so you buy a stock if the chart's broken? Yeah, because if the fundamentals and the earnings power are big enough, I know in my gut, I'm still going to win. So I've done that for years and years and years, and it works. I do not buy broken charts if earnings suck or it's a turnaround story because you don't have that as a backdrop. 
But there will be a point where SMCI, no matter how ugly the chart is, is probably a buy. So for me, that's that's a bit lower. It's trying to hang on to the 8 and 10, and it's under the 21. But right here, it's no interest to me. Here's the thing, though. I just want to call, call it like I see it. I get why some people might start to call this a cup and handle. I see a cup, and I see it trying to form a handle. So some people are going to get bullish if this handle, it's, it's right here, if it continues to do that, which means it's mm -hmm. back above 1,000. Then you have kind of like a little cup and handle chart. Like I said, I'm not an expert, so some people might be like, cup's not perfect. But it's trying to do a cup and handle, which is, by the way, bullish. So I see a, a bullish aspect to it as well. Okay. I'm hoping it goes lower to buy it ugly pre-earnings and pre-a split announcement. That's how mm -hmm. I'll play it, if I get that lucky. And Jonathan, what's your thoughts on Coinbase? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think their business is kind of uh, doing a lot better than anyone anticipated. And it's proven to be. Like one of the best proxies ever uh but if you know bitcoin's gonna go lower so shall it and it's up huge so now it's where charts matter and levels come in so if bitcoin's gonna back off bitcoin i said to inner circle today bitcoin doesn't hold sixty-five thousand. and by the way i don't just say this to say it because it's at 65 i really said 65 should hold if not 62 62 5 and then it could be under sixty thousand. but I mean, the, the, this is like so easy right here, right? If Bitcoin does not bounce, Coinbase is under the 21 day. It loves the 21 day. You do not have to be a chart expert to see that since it broke out from mid-February, it's been above the 21 day. We're now below. So if it closes below, you have tons of downside all the way down to 216. So I probably wouldn't be a buyer. I, I, I'm not big on chasing, so I probably won't even do this. So it captured the 20, recaptured the 21 day, which as of right now is 249. My cup of tea would be it gets ugly, starts to fill some of this gap uh, down to 216, and that's where I'd be interested. Below that, you have the 50 day. So that, that's how I play Coinbase. I want to buy something that ultimately has a bullish trend on a real pullback. That's just how I do well and how I do things. Other people like buying high, selling higher. I think that works in perfect bull markets. I think. The perfect bull market may not be with us for a bit. All right. You sent out this tweet over the weekend. I think this is a good topic to end things on here. Uh, you are a really great trader at um, playing both sides of a stock. Uh, you can have a loss in a stock and come back and have a winner. You can have, you know, you can win long in the stock and do well on the short side the next day. You're really good at just looking at the day, the stock that day. So you said over the weekend, one issue that many traders go through is poor results consistently in one name. Usually it's self-inflicted as they're reacting to the past. Take the emotion out. Some of my largest wins have been in stocks that I had losses in prior. So what is it about your trading mentality that allows you to really take the emotion out and just look at the numbers, look at the chart, look at the stock as the price that it's at that day and what strategy works for you that day, even if you've had a loss in it in the past? the most earnest answer i can give you is hundreds of thousands of dollars of losses not looking at it like that <laughs> so i was like i better change it uh so on a serious note there are too many people that lose in a stock and lose in a stock and then they start to trade it from how they feel about it versus whatever happened yesterday is over and if there is a great setup in it today and it's the opposite side it's okay to take and moreover, whatever happened in the past, no matter how much money you lost, is done. So just look at it with a clean slate today. I don't care if it's NVDA. To you, it's XYZ. And you're trading it for the first time today. And if the setup is great, and if it's something that is the antithesis of what you've done prior, so be it. Trade it with a clean head. And that's that took me a lot of years to get to, but that's so important. I, I When I hear people like, oh, I always lose money on that stock. I'm not buying it. And then... Then it turns out to be the biggest winner. Whatever happened in the past just happened. Now, that doesn't mean just trade it to trade it. There has to be a reason. But I do also hate when people write off a name and they miss tremendous opportunity because of a, an emotion they have due to a, a past mistake. So it has to do with looking at things with a clean head and just letting the past be in the past. Mm -hmm. All right, great. All right, David, I'm going to let you get back to trading. Everyone who's with us, uh, he is a real trader. He's, he's going to get back to the market. We've 
at him for 45 minutes. But if you'd like to apply to join the Inner Circle with David and get more of his insights on a day-to-day -day basis, you can go to t3live.com slash DP. Again, that's to apply for the Inner Circle, which is the virtual trading floor or trading room that David runs here with us at T3 Life. David, good luck on the rest of your trading day. And everyone else, uh, thank, thank you. you for joining us and good luck as well. We're all excited to see pictures of your baby. Yes, uh, everyone, I am having a baby this weekend. Uh, so I will not be back for the next few weeks, but uh, we'll have a new host whose mic's going to fill in for me while I'm gone, but I will be back uh, later this summer. So looking forward to it. Thank you, you for doing this. A few months. All right. Thanks, David. Bye, guys. Bye.